Our Studium Generale is a monthly lecture series on various topics as part of our interdisciplinary activities. This lecture series will delve into the realms of ancient wisdom and modern discoveries in the history of science, which includes many aspects of philosophy. This topic would also be an opportunity to show the students that, studying, at least at the university, is not just repeating what the teacher said, but much more. The first lecture provides a general introduction and focuses on two famous theories of science. Karl Popper's Logic of Scientific Discovery and Thomas Kuhn's The Paradigm Shift. The second lecture is titled From Mythos to Logos, which refers to the basic ideas of the ancient natural philosophers. In this part, we'll present some ideas of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. In the old days, in the times of animism, humans believed in a living nature. Every tree, every cloud had its own life. Later, people believed that events on earth were the result of the moods of the gods. However, about 2,500 years ago, in Greece, people began to ask whether there were natural rules that men could understand. This was the birth of science. Since then, people have been searching for the truth. But it took another 2,000 years until Isaac Newton, who discovered the laws of gravity, proved that nature can be calculated by mathematical means. But what drove people to set out in search of truth? Humans are self-reflective beings. Therefore, they have a natural desire to understand the world. And there is also a practical benefit. If I understand the world, I can better predict the future and avoid the tricks and traps of life. The ancient Greeks called the love of wisdom, in their words, philosophy. But there has always been the question of the limits of human knowledge. Immanuel Kant posed three fundamental questions. What can I know, which is related to epistemology? What must I do, which is related to morality? What may I hope, in other words, what is my destiny? Later, he added, what is the truth? There are two potential ways that men have believed to find the truth. On the one hand is faith. In the past, there was a lack of knowledge about the rules of nature. People tried to find explanations in divine activities. The events on earth are the results of quarrels among the gods or because the gods love to play games with men. This led to religion. Men appointed priests, and priests collected the stories of the various gods and built a uniform pantheon. They tried to reveal the will and desires of the gods. Of course, human behavior and desires were the models according to which the gods were shaped. Accordingly, religious rules were seen as a means to appease the gods and protect people from disasters such as floods or earthquakes. Scarification and prayers were used to gain the support of gods, such as rain or victory in war. In some areas, beliefs and rules were laid down in holy books such as the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. In the 15th century, modern science was born in Europe. Scientists claimed that the world is made up of a certain set of rules. People can explore these rules through the means of science. Therefore, science became the search for the truth about natural rules. But there is no more room for metaphysical explanations, which brought science into conflict with religion. When Copernicus, Kepler and Galilei moved the sun to the center of our solar system instead of the earth. The Pope in Rome felt challenged, and Galilei was silenced by threats of torture. He had to withdraw his thesis. But in the end, the arguments of the scientists became more and more convincing, 
after science had made great progress not only in the field of medicine but also in warfare, when scientists developed better and more precise weapons. But there was a fundamental problem. How can people acquire knowledge at all? The deductionists said that we have to sit down and think about the basic principles of the world, and from that point, we can discover more and more details. So, they believed in a top-down approach. Controversially, the empiricists said, our mind is like a blank sheet of paper. It is only experience that provides people with knowledge. If we think we have discovered a law of nature, we have to do experiments to find out whether it is true or not. So they took a bottom-up approach. But the general problem is that all we know about the world is what we can sense with our sensory organs. Consequently, all we can do is observe ourselves. Natural evolution made us this way, and therefore, all people perceive the world in a similar manner. But we will never know what things really look like. Probably, the world does not actually look like how people perceive it, and solipsists even claim that the world around us is just an illusion. Immanuel Kant famously said, We can only know appearances, not things in themselves. But he believed that there are some basic categories of human thoughts that make us perceive the world in a certain, reliable way. This idea united empiricism and deductionism. At least in the natural sciences, it is assumed that there is a real world and that human beings can observe it, at least to some extent. So there are humans, who are the subjects, and a world that surrounds them. However, as we will learn later in the context of quantum physics, the borderline is probably quite different from what we usually imagine. This is also reflected in the way our knowledge is composed in different types of science. In some areas, our knowledge is based almost entirely on the revelation of the rules of nature. This is true of mathematics. The rules of mathematics were created with the Big Bang and will exist as long as this universe exists. Therefore, this knowledge is more or less independent of human beings. At the other end of the spectrum is art which is more or less independent of the physical world. To write a poem, the author only needs his ideas and creativity. He does not need to look through a telescope or a microscope or perform any experiments. Werner Heisenberg, one of the fathers of quantum physics and winner of the Nobel Prize in 1932, in his book, The Part and the Whole, established the following ladder of sciences. Mathematics is the fundamental science. Physics comes second, because it is based mainly on external observations. In chemistry, the part of human imagination is already important, but external observations still dominate. Biology is the tipping point, where human imagination and external observation are probably in balance. In medicine, and at least in psychology, the part of human reasoning is much higher than what we learn by observing nature. The social sciences, including legal sciences, are disciplines that deal to a large extent only with the products of human imagination, while the part of observations about the physical world remains small. For example, legal entities, or the idea of property did not exist before they were invented by humans. As mentioned before, art is at the end of this ladder. Except for his own physical existence, the artist basically does not need the physical world for his creation. Which brings us to the next question. Where do new ideas and creativity come from? Take the story of Albert Einstein. 
It is said that he realized that kinetic energy and gravitational energy are the same while riding the tram home from work. This idea eventually led him to the theory of relativity and his famous equation, energy equals matter times the speed of light to the power of two. Like millions of people, I frequently take the tram. But this idea never crossed my mind and the minds of millions and millions of other tram users since Einstein. So, what made Einstein come up with this fancy idea? We will probably never know, and even Einstein himself would not have been able to explain it. Of course, many wise men have pondered this problem. One of them was Karl Popper. In his famous book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, Popper argues that real science is based on the methodology of falsifiability. No number of experiments can ever prove a theory, but one reproducible experiment or observation can disprove a hypothesis. Even if you have observed only white swans all your life, you cannot be sure that black swans do not exist. Therefore, a hypothesis, such as, all swans are white, does not advance science. But as soon as you see a single black swan, your hypothesis about white swans is refuted, and that is solid knowledge. On this basis, you can continue your research. So, science is based on reproducible experiments, but ultimately it lives on falsifications. About 30 years later, another wise man, Thomas Kuhn, wrote a book called The Paradigm Shift, in which he opposed Popper. After studying the history of quantum physics, Kuhn argued that science does not evolve gradually toward truth. Science has a paradigm that remains constant until it undergoes a paradigm shift, when current theories can't explain some phenomenon, and someone proposes a new theory. Before Max Planck discovered that light is pixeled into quants, the rules of Newton's mechanics were sacrosanct. But then scientists discovered that this was not true at the level of atoms and at the scale of the cosmos. It took about 30 years to change Newton's paradigm. Since then, under the new paradigm of quantum and relativity theory, physical science is back to normal and basically works according to the rules that Popper described. But, of course, this does not explain what inspired Planck, Einstein, Heisenberg, and all the other great scientists to overthrow paradigms. With all that we know, it seems more and more likely that we are just part of the universe watching itself evolve from the nothing of the Big Bang.